Art, such as paintings and photographs, used to be a one-way presentation to the audience. Yet, in the digital era, art has modernized itself with the aid of various technologies and media, and transformed into an innovatively interactive and immersive mode of expression, offering a unique experience to visitors of museums and galleries. In this Talk of the Metropolis, Professor Jeffrey Shaw, Chair Professor of the Academy of Visual Arts at Hong Kong Baptist University, will talk on the topic New Media Art, the conjunction of digital technology and new modes of aesthetic expression and experience. Professor Shaw will share the process of the creation of some of his past and recent works and give us a glimpse into the latest innovations and design in the presentation of art. To address this topic, uh, my presentation today will engage with examples of my media art practice over the last 50 years. An understanding of immersive media art can be achieved by looking at some of the most important topics and techniques. From the 60s to today, I have reacted against the conventional passive relationship between the spectator and the artwork. In the 60s and 70s, I worked a lot with inflatables that invited physical participation. Also engaging the public outside the museum and outside the gallery, going into urban spaces and creating situations of opportunity for public interaction. The transformation of sculpture from an object that you look at to an object that you get inside of. To create extraordinary experiences like walking on water. In the 80s, the opportunities provided by interactive computer graphics opened whole new realms of viewer engagement and participation. In the legible city, the viewer rides a bicycle through an urban landscape where the buildings are all made up of text. In this recent pose-matching installation, the public can try to imitate Kung Fu masters using Kinect tracking system. An interactive artwork has very much to do with the design and functionality of the interface. Sometimes simply a switch is enough. Pulling the handle in this work causes a group of virtual humans to fall and then rise up when it is released. Another version of this work uses the switch inside a mat on the floor that you stand on. And notice that every time this group of virtual figures falls down, they will fall differently. This work was also recently uh, on exhibition in Germany, and here it was projected onto a wall which was 250 meters long and 10 meters high. Pushing the handle of this installation rotates a monitor through a database of hundreds of images. Walking down this path towards the screen, you cross infrared beams that trigger a series of image transformations. And the legible city's bicycle is one of the most natural and versatile interfaces. For this particular work, I created the chair as an interface. And by rotating it and leaning back and forth, you control your movements in the virtual world, as well as the synchronous rotation of the motorized platform that you are sitting on. So you have a mixed reality experience. You are both 
moving in the real world and also moving in the virtual world. This interface is a laterally movable screen that lets you explore a digital database of images and videos. And here it's being deployed in a recent exhibition on Italian swordsmanship. This interface scans your hand to extract the main lines and then puts these lines into a visual space where you can connect with the history of other people's hand lines. And at our recent Tycoon exhibition, The Way of the Sword, you can train to become a master swordsman using optical tracking of your arm movements. Instead of a head-mounted display, this interface connects head tracking to a robotic projector inside a dome. In this way, you can explore an immersive spherical virtual world simply by moving your head. The interface in this early CAVE, CAVE is a technology for a 3D projection on three walls and the floor. In this early CAVE artwork, the interface is a wooden puppet, and the wooden puppet has sensors in all its joints. And so by manipulating the puppet, the viewer modulates the real-time imagery as well as the real-time soundscape. I'm wearing 3D glasses. It's actually a 3D experience. The puppet also lets you travel from one virtual world to another. If you close the puppet's eyes and then open them again, you are in a different world. Developing interfaces is also about developing new forms of immersive visualization environments. And these are just some of the systems which I've developed over the years. My art practice is not only about getting the spectator to enter the artwork, but also about getting the artwork to merge with the real world. This is one of my first augmented reality artworks. It's a, a CRT monitor and a see-through mirror, which can be rotated and tilted to reveal virtual objects which are floating in different locations in the room. One of these objects was the word future with a question mark. The question of the future remains still urgent today. I should explain that the simplicity of its virtual objects was determined by the very limited graphics of the Apple II computer which I was using when I first created this work. This augmented reality installation at La Villette in Paris takes the form of a rotatable periscope-like device. It's an interactive video disc-based work that lets you choose and see various video images that are floating out in different parts of the museum. So only the person who is looking through the optical system can see this image floating out in the gallery space. This pioneering augmented reality artwork uses a TV screen that you can hold in your hands and lets you view a virtual golden calf standing on a real pedestal. Today's upgraded version of this artwork uses a tablet, optical tracking, and with four video cameras which are embedded in the pedestal, the viewers can now see their real-time reflection in the skin of the golden calf. So this is both augmented reality and what we call mixed reality. Interactive works like this are performative and their aesthetic identity is expressed in their embodied engagement with humans, with people who are actually interacting with the work. 
This augmented reality installation presents one of the famous Dunhuang Buddhist caves in China. An optically tracked iPad allows you to explore a one-to-one -one scale 3D model of this cave, which was created by laser scanning and photogrammetry. For an exhibition on Leonardo da Vinci, we made an AR installation that lets you enter the cave that he painted in the version of the rocks. Again, using tracked iPads, you can go behind the foreground figures and explore a detailed model of that cave with all its rockery and plants. This installation evokes the situation that we face in COVID times. It's a locker cabinet printed with an image of the COVID virus. And using a tablet, you can open the doors of this locker cabinet and find a lonely person inside each locker exercising to stay fit. And these exercises are learned all from watching video games. So all these movements are coming from a library of video game motion capture. Here's an unusual VR experiment where instead of using your hand as an interface, uh, you are use your tongue to modulate the virtual world. It uses a simple switch again that first needs to be hygienically protected. And then you put it in your mouth where you can press it with your tongue. So basically you interact with the virtual world by using your tongue to put pressure on a switch. It's a little experiment how to connect your different senses together, this time connecting the senses of your mouth, tongue with your eyes. Well, this was a, a really major project. We worked, I think, over two years on this project. And at the moment, we are working with the Tourist Commission to do the next phase. I think we currently have about 28 locations uh, where these um, markers have been set up. Here, a performance by the Japanese dancer Saburo Teshigawara was video recorded in 3D from six different points of view. This is then represented via 3D back projection onto the six surfaces of a large hexagonal enclosure around which the viewer can walk and watch the performances from six points of view. This is in effect a holographic reconstruction. The performers are viewable in 3D at one-to-one -one scale as if they were actually dancing inside this uh, hexagonal enclosure. Interactivity goes hand in hand with crafting new forms of immersive experience. This is a 250 meter long inflatable tube that people could walk through to cross a lake. It provided an exceptionally immersive experience for all the senses. This is a 4K, 4,000 pixel full dome installation in India. Lying down, one could look up and view animations of numerous ceiling architectures of heritage buildings in Mumbai. These are just some of the beautiful ceilings which we shot fisheye images of for this project. Narrative forms have to be reinvented for the interactive experience. Working with Peter Gabriel in Genesis and using automated slide projection on three screens, we created one of the first music concerts to be accompanied by a continuous visual narrative, over 3,000 slides. The Legible City is also a narrative space that replaces buildings with words and sentences. As you bicycle freely around, you are recombining words and phrases into a personal narrative. Here's what the legible city's narrative Amsterdam looks like from above. In this work, we recorded the Singaporean poet Edwin Thumbu reciting 28 different poems and then put them in a 360-degree 3D projection environment. Using a microphone to control a virtual microphone, the viewer could choose which poem to listen to 
and in cutting between them create a new and unique set of poetic combinations. So 28 different poems by the same author and you are basically sampling pieces of each of the poem and joining them together to create a completely new poem. Creating cinema in the round is a particular challenge. The solution I came up with in 2004 was to create a space of multiple interconnected narratives that the viewer could freely navigate. This vision of an interactive cinema on the one hand is linear because the film is pre-recorded, but it allows the viewer to become the camera person and also the editor so that everyone assembles their own personal movie experience. We built this panoramic video camera to shoot another such interactive multi-narrative movie with the Wooster Group in New York. Uh, its interface is a chair that allows the viewer to look around and the area that you're looking at is in focus, whereas everything outside in the periphery is out of focus. Similarly, the soundtrack is modulated to the direction you are looking. In this installation, over 30,000 video clips that were sourced from free-to-air television can be interactively explored in a 3D space. Each of the video clips has metadata, so when you click on any of it, it will search for others that are similar and cluster them in front of you and at the same time placing the most dissimilar clips behind you. By dragging and dropping these video clips, you can assemble your own movie. It's a kind of a narrative Lego kit. Today's art practices concern both the contemporary and the re-imaging and reconfiguration of the past. Hampi is a heritage site in India. And in this work, a rotating platform lets viewers explore this heritage site in 360 degrees and 3D. This is the rotating dual head camera system we use to capture 3D photographic panoramas. These are left and right eye images, which were then scanned. The scanned panoramas were then used to construct a virtual landscape. In many of these panoramic scenes, we composited 3D animations of Hindu gods. Here, for example, is Ganesha. Navigating Hampi's virtual landscape, you can choose to enter any one of its cylinders and then view its heritage site as a surrounding one-to-one -one scale 3D experience. Entering another of its sites, we encounter Shiva performing a dance. So this is motion capture of a live dancer and then the motion capture given to an animation studio who then animated uh, the Shiva figure and then the Shiva figure is composited into the photographic background. This is the escarpment at Dunhuang in China, site of the famous Buddhist caves. The Dunhuang Academy have extensively photographed these caves and also laser scanned their architectures. And we combined these data sets to create an optimized 3D model. We presented these virtual caves in our interactive 360 degree stereoscopic projection system. First, we simulate the real world torchlight experience, and then we can fully illuminate the cave. A virtual magnifying glass lets you examine the paintings in detail. One can also view parts of the painting with their original colours restored. Objects in the painting, like this musical instrument, emerge out of the painting as an animated 3D model, while the painted dancers come to life as well. These are grass figures made by Indigenous Australians. We did photogrammetry of each of them so that they could be put into a full dome animation that we made for the National Museum of Australia. We've done quite some work with Chinese martial arts, motion capturing Hong Kong Kung Fu masters to build a heritage archive of their movements. 
also exploring styles and methods of visual analytics and creating art installations to show the results. Here the viewer can interact with the archival database, choosing different forms of visual expressions. The motion capture data is given new artistic interpretations. Interpretations that evoke the inner dynamics of Kung Fu and its energies. Master Lem Se Wing was a great martial artist of the early 20th century in Hong Kong. He left many photos of himself from which we could build a new 3D model of this person. Then we motion captured his great grand nephew performing one of Lam Se Wing's Kung Fu sets and applied that data to the virtual model and with this result. So this is Master Lam Se Wing brought back to life and animated by his great grandnephew. The remaking of Confucian rites projects consists of the reenactment of rites recorded in the Yi Li, which was compiled by followers of Confucius in the 5th century BCE. The scholarship on which this reenactment of these rites is based is provided by the Center for Chinese Ritual Studies at Tsinghua University under the guidance of Professor Peng Lin. Three of these ceremonies have been done so far, the capping ceremony, the archery ceremony, and this, the marriage ceremony. Each took about one year to prepare. The project explores numerous mediated strategies of documentation of these ritual performances. For example, a kind of Google Maps aerial view recording of the entire performance. Also using 360 degree high resolution video camera to enable immersive VR view of the performance. This archival project also documents the performer's uh, costume, their attire. It also offers analytical documentation of all the ritual behaviors and postures. And the resulting documentary archive can be presented and experienced in various ways. Here, for instance, as a three-channel installation at the Art Institute of Chicago. And the installation specifically focuses on the use of ritual vessels. This three-screen installation presents a very immersive experience of the capping ceremony. And even more immersive will be our VR renderings of these ceremonies, which we plan to publish as an app for home viewing. And here the VR model is a hybrid virtual world that incorporates all the real-life video recordings that we made and the viewer can freely navigate the temple environment and choose whichever video sequence they want to enter. The Archery Ceremony app is now available for both iOS and Android users. The app provides an introduction by Professor Penlin and a 30-minute documentary film. But besides offering these conventional forms of video documentation, the most important feature of this app is its interactive archive. In this archive, over eight hours of video data is organized geographically, north, south, east, west, according to where the action is taking place at the temple site. And up to 12 video clips can be running simultaneously around the central window and the viewer is the real-time editor of these multiple video streams, able to view the performance from any point of view. So basically, this, you know, the central window is your window which is playing, but all around are other uh, videos that belong to this scene, and you can just dynamically edit between those and bring them into the central window. So actually, it's a kind of editing function that you do rather than giving that job to an edit to a sort of pre-edited documentary. Now I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about our recent Atlas of Maritime Buddhism project. It's based on the compelling story of the spread of Buddhism from India through the seaports of Southeast Asia and South China Sea. 
The spread of Buddhist doctrine from India to China triggered a profusion of cross-cultural exchanges that had a profound impact on Asian and world history. Unique fieldwork techniques are used to create data across this project, including panoramic video, spherical video, spherical gigapixel photography, and digital 3D panoramas. Also ambisonic field recording for immersive 360 degree sound. And photogrammetry also enabled us to create 3D models of numerous Buddhist sculptures. Having created all these digital assets, our next challenge was to create new exhibition experiences with innovative new media concepts and designs. The most recent exhibition was at City University, and I'll take you on a quick walk through. We first encounter a map of the Great Circle of Buddhism showing the overland and maritime routes across Asia. Then an animation of the monsoonal trade routes showing porcelain going east to west and spices going from west to east. Buddhist monks accompanied these ships to protect sailors from storms and pirates on these dangerous voyages. The first exhibition room highlights the key themes of the atlas. Firstly, those famous monks that made extraordinary long travels across Asia. Then the topics of transition of the teaching, followed by Buddhist stupa architecture. Then the anaconic and embodied representation of the Buddha. And ending with the most revered maritime bodhisattvas, Alakoskikvara and Guanyin. The exhibition features treasured objects loaned by Hong Kong collectors. And these are joined together with animations of photogrammetric models that we made of the most significant Buddhist sculptures across Asia. Perhaps the most ambitious aspect of our Atlas project was the panoramic photography of hundreds of Buddhist sites across seven countries. Our linear navigator lets you travel from India to China and visit these sites along the way. Another presentation of these panoramas was in our so-called panoramic navigator. Inside a circular screen, visitors could rotate the projected image and choose which of the seven countries they wanted to visit. Here the visitor will choose to go to Myanmar, traveling over the ocean, then arriving on shore and crossing a carpeted landscape to arrive at and enter one or other of the panoramic sites there. And once arriving, the viewer can rotate their point of view over the entire 360-degree scene. This projected image can also be viewed on the outside of the cylinder. Besides the panoramic image, we also shot gigapixel spherical photographs inside Indian Buddhist caves. These could be interactively explored by viewers inside our hemispherical projection eye dome. The visitor could rotate the image space and switch from one cave to another. Another of these items showed spherical videos that we recorded of Buddhist chanting and rituals. The items using projected spherical photography or cinematography are very effective means of giving the viewer an intensely immersive and enjoyable interactive experience. Uh, in the last room of the exhibition are pictures on the floor fisheye images whose QR codes enable you to enter and view these spherical Buddhist scenes using your smartphone. These are some examples of these uh, sticker images on the floor and the spherical virtual scenes they offer to the smartphone or tablet user. And of course very, very popular with kids. This exhibition was first designed as a permanent uh, exhibition for Fo Guan Shan Buddha Museum in Taiwan. Because of the COVID outbreak, its opening was delayed for over a year. And here are some pictures from that exhibition. Basically, it's a scaled up and more refined version of the temporary exhibition that we made in Hong Kong. The animated photogrammetric sculptures had their own dedicated space to swirl around in with their viewers walking amongst them. The linear navigator at Fogun Shan has two screens, so it's two screens wide, so it, it's um, more suited to show the, the, you know, the panoramic aspect ratio of uh, imagery. And our items at Fogun Shan were also larger and therefore more immersive.
The most imposing installation at Foguanshan was this 12 meter diameter projection panorama with its eight projectors and 14K resolution viewers were taken on ocean journeys to the seven countries and 70 Buddhist sites. And here we're traveling to India to visit the famous stupa at Sanchi. To conclude this presentation, I'll show you some installations that were commissioned for the recently opened Hong Kong Palace Museum. Now these artworks all take the legacy of Chinese artifacts coming from the Beijing Palace Museum and they reformulate and reinvigorate them by doubling them into the domain of computational virtualization. This is a panoramic journey over the Forbidden City to visit the Hall of Ancestor Worship. Uh, this installation is the dreamscape of the Qing Dynasty Emperor that the audience can share by lying down on a circular couch underneath a circular projection screen. Calligraphy by Wang Dongling visualizes a poem that the lamenting emperor wrote about his deceased wife. This installation creates an augmented reality where a virtual world populated by these flying mythological horses is co-present in the real space of the exhibition gallery. And it's based on the fact that there are actual physical objects in the collection as well as paintings of these mythological flying creatures. Whereas the virtual world shows, has these horses flying around in the actual exhibition space. So there are four screens hanging from the ceiling. And there are virtual cameras which pick up these horses as they're flying around. And then you see them crossing these screens. So it's a dynamic real-time animation of these uh, flying horses. These are other works in the collection. This uh, beautiful horse was painted by Giuseppe Castiglione. These are the tribute horses. And then uh, Jean-Denis Attere uh, copied these horses, 10 tribute horses. Both of these exhibits are in the collection. And what I did was to basically take all 10 horses and recomposite them into a virtual procession of horses and also uh, presented them as a lenticular print so that you have a very interesting 3D effect as you move around you, because of the lenticular print technology. And then I'd like to show you this last work. It's one of the paintings in the museum is Giuseppe Castiglione's Eight Steeds. So this installation references the same artist drawing of a hundred horses that is in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And eight horses interact with visitors to the museum who are being tracked by connect sensors. And while the style of the horses is based on the Castiglione drawing, they're here being animated in real time by motion capture data that we made of actual horses. I should explain that as far as the interaction goes, the only interactive data is how close you are to the horse, the proximity. So all these other seeming interactions are just chance interactions as a consequence of the way the horse behaves. But interestingly, people assume or take it as a personal expression of their engagement with the horse. This work tells you a lot about where, let's say, interaction in the metaverse might lead us. Okay, with this work, I would like to conclude this presentation. And uh, thanks so much for uh, your kind attention.